Thank you, Henry. Um, it's my job really to provide a little color and contrast and perspective, and uh, if you can handle it, I'm going to be relatively brief and I'm going to be uh, lighthearted, uh, pretty much. Um, I'm going to give, though, the same talk that Larry did and the same talk that Ellen did, but I'm going to do it with a whole lot less sophistication and a whole lot more pictures. Um, because I think the points that we're making are, are very, very related. Um, we're, uh, we're thinking today, I think, about what it is uh, we do when we make something criminal, and in particular, whether we really know what we're doing when we make something criminal. Uh, this is a panel at the end, and uh, as you uh, are well aware, we're the only thing standing between uh, you and a good stiff drink. <laughs> So that means that what we really ought to be doing, uh, as I think we are, is to try to think big thoughts, uh, to send you off uh, with something uh, really massive uh, to ponder. Uh, to quote uh, the mystery passage, you ought to be thinking about concepts of existence, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Now, really, I'm the wrong guy uh, for this. I don't know that much about criminal law. But Henry Butler, God bless him, keeps inviting me to Searle things, and I like coming to them. So I'm going to take a shot. Here's a recurrent theme that you've heard several times already today. The criminal law is society's way of coming up with scapegoats, people to blame when things uh, don't go right. And that's Holman Hunt's famous uh, picture of a scapegoat. The scapegoat, just in case you've forgotten, was a goat that was driven off into the wilderness as part of the ceremonies of the Day of Atonement during the times of the Temple in Jerusalem. And you can uh, check it out in Leviticus 16. Um, it's a long-standing practice, and I think the uh, criminal system and the social system use it. Uh, you've seen others uh, who constitute really variations on the theme. The Aztecs used to sacrifice young people to the gods to propitiate them. Uh, we sacrifice, uh, Ellen has indicated it, Larry has indicated it, uh, our financial miscreants, um, usually at the end of uh, any particular uh, boom or, uh, or bust, as we're dealing with now. We, though, tend to sacrifice wizened old white guys. I think that's a move forward. <laughs> um, we, we have a problem here, though. Uh, we do need somebody, I think this has been sort of alluded to, to sacrifice as a result of the current financial crisis, but we got a problem because nobody knows what caused this crisis. I'm going to give you several possible answers and several possible scapegoats. Uh, there's a media answer, and uh, it's also Barack Obama's. It's hedge fund managers or unscrupulous bankers, greedy corporate fat cats. Uh, so we should sacrifice some of those high-flying and greedy Wall Street gamblers, or perhaps evil financial wizards who were insufficiently regulated by government. And clearly there's some truth to this. These guys created trillions of dollars in derivatives, credit default swaps, mortgage-backed securities that nobody understands. And it's easy to say all this was done just for a fast buck. But if you read about this stuff and you try to ponder it, you find that there are different views. Let's take the Wall Street Journal's view for a moment. And most recently, just in the last two days, Chase Bank CEO Jamie DeMont, they have made a powerful case that the reason for the crisis was pressure from Congress, including the Clinton era Community Reinvestment Act and conduct on the part of Bernie Frank and Chris Dodd and others, you notice the same pose, by the way, and others, and that's also, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. These folks, these two, it's said, allowed Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to make too many loans to uncreditworthy borrowers who defaulted on a massive scale. Well, given my politics, probably uh, not necessarily that, of the group here, I think we ought to throw Barney Frank and Chris jo Dodd in jail on general principles, and it may yet happen. Still, there's a case to be made that the financial crisis was caused by too much regulation, in particular Sarbanes and Oxley, and there uh, the two of them are, which imposed compliance costs that suddenly imposed a heavy financial burden on existing companies and further drove IPOs out of the American market and in particular, kind of a corollary of Sarbanes-Oxley, 
mark-to-market accounting, which I think one could say did in fact uh, help things get worse. Um, indeed, if you uh, check out the, blogos the blogosphere, you can find some really interesting things said about mark-to-market accounting. One blogger recently wrote, we need to kill mark-to-market accounting before it eats us alive. These accounting rules are like the blob, an alien life form that consumes everything in its path as it grows and grows. Both the blob and mark-to-market accounting crawl, creep, and eat everything, dead or alive, in their path. We need to save ourselves by putting mark-to-market accounting into deep freeze while there's still something left to save. Well, in any event, mark-to-market accounting did have the effect of driving down the value of assets on balance sheets and leading to requirements of additional capital that simply couldn't easily be met, leading to the failure of some corporations and utter reluctance to lend on the part of others. Paul Sarbanes is no longer with us, so we can't put him in jail, but maybe we can incarcerate Michael Oxley. Fortunately, however, mark-to-market accounting rules have been eased, and that's one reason the market has, uh, until today, uh, risen recently about 20% or so. Now, uh, because of my politics, I like the explanation that Barney Frank and Chris Dodd caused the financial crisis, but I have to be honest. In my heart of hearts, I think that there may be no way to prevent occasional market downturns, that there's a business cycle and the market goes up and the market goes down. And human beings being who they are, irrational exuberance, as Alan Greenspan reminded us, will occasionally lead to the market to rise too much and it will eventually fall. And when that happens, we try to find somebody to blame. But it might be just the way markets work. But I don't have any real proof of that. So I think what all of this suggests uh, is another great theme of American history. And that is, again, a theme that's been uh, sounded many, many times uh, in uh, the last few hours. And that is that there's a general understanding that goes deep in Anglo-American jurisprudence, that we have to be leery about criminalizing too much. That's the great theme of this conference. And I think it's eminently sensible. And let's be honest about that. It's our tradition that heroic judges, like all of you, Heroic judges are our guardians. That's the reason for the common law's presumption of, evidence, uh, of innocence, for the privilege against self-incrimination, and for the requirement of the proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That and similar safeguards are all measures essentially entrusted to judges. There's also an American tradition going back to 1812, when the United States Supreme Court decided that there was no federal common law of crimes the first great blow against overly aggressive federal prosecutors. And eventually, many of the states followed suit and abolished common law crimes at the state level. Perhaps then, we're in an era when that kind of inspired judicial safeguarding is again called for. That's how, after all, we preserve, preserve truth, justice, and the American way. And that's your job. But you don't need me to tell you that. And that's all I have to say. <laughs>